prayer. Let me find out where we stopped last time. There it is. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for life in Christ, and we thank you for steadfast promises. Uh, we are told, and it's obvious, that we live by faith, but our faith is not just a shot in the dark. It's not a leap, but it is a true rest in the promises that have been given. So we pray that as we uh, do this survey of how the Bible unfolds its message that we might more and more find ourselves <clears throat> resting uh, in the Lord and, and not fretting, not worrying, not living in fear, not living in anger or rage, whatever our problems are that we all have but instead that we would rest in Christ because we indeed have a living hope in him. So bless us in this hour, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so as I understand it, we've, we've finished one lap. <laughs> and some people are already tired, but that's okay. <laughs> Not all laps are the same. I think where we get to the covenantal. This is where we stopped in the book. It's on uh, somewhere around page 17. Uh, so what we've seen so far is that, you know, Moses wrote the book of Genesis, the first and the first five books, which are called the the, the Pentateuch or the Torah. Penta is taken from the number five, the Pentagon, the Pentateuch. Uh, and so there are five books of the law, Torah, five books of Moses. Um, and so what, what we're going to begin seeing, and I think when you read the text and, and the rest of the Bible, this becomes more and more clear is that what God is doing, he took his people, they were already his people, promised to whom, through whom, before even Moses. Abraham, way back. <clears throat> Brandon gave that wonderful sermon a couple of weeks ago on covenant and how God called Abraham uh, out of his own pagan lifestyle and said, I want you to be my man through whom I'm going to raise up a people and bless the entire world. So that promise was made early on and Abraham obeyed and went. And in Romans and in other places in the Bible, he's used as the illustration of the example of saving faith because he didn't do anything to gain favor with God. God came to him. He responded in simple faith. And the just are saved by faith, we're told, in Habakkuk, and then again in the book of Romans, and Galatians, and Hebrews, and Ephesians, and Colossians. Uh, so, so God chose these people. They went into captivity uh, with whom? Who? Huh? Who was their leader at that time? Well, uh, that was a bad question. That's not a leader. <laughs> yeah, that was not a good question. But the family. They, yeah, who was the family? The, the leader of the family at the time? Israel. Yeah, Jacob. Israel, Jacob. Jacob. Same, same guy, Jacob. Israel, Jacob, his name. And so uh, there were a few of them. They went down into Egypt. Happenstance that their son was the ruler down there. And they stayed there for 400 years. Obviously, those guys died off and they... <coughs> grew in family. So uh, Moses, we, we read, came and got him by God's commission and miraculously led them out into the desert to worship him, as, as Moses told Pharaoh. 
You're going to let my people go so they can go and worship me. Um, so what we're going to begin finding now in Moses and the rest of the scriptures as they unveil is that it was God's intent when he led them to Sinai, that's the first place they really gathered as a people and hung out for a while before they did their wandering, is that God brought them there to enter into covenant with them. And so uh, let's read, uh, look at page 17 in your book. And I hope you'll bring your book every time because we're going to be reading a lot of the book. And your Bible, and I will quote from the prayer book today, but I put it on the slide, assuming that not everybody would probably bring their prayer book because I forgot to tell you to. Uh, look at the, the chapter where it says covenantal foundation. The opening chapters of Genesis were not only intended to correct the mistaken notions of the Hebrews about how the universe was constructed. And we saw that last week. Remember what, what were some of the influences, who were some of those who influenced views on creation back in that time? Two of the major ones. Mesopotamia. Yeah, Mesopotamia and Egypt. 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 You, they, they all had written accounts of what they thought creation must have been like <coughs> and so forth. And so Genesis clearly corrects that, Genesis 1. Uh, because God makes it, Moses makes it clear that God is not part of the universe. He didn't take something and form it and make it into what we now call the world. There was no world. There was no nothing. Only God. And he said, let there be. <laughs> and it came into being. That's awesome. And so this God is awesome. And that becomes real clear to the Israelites when God, when Moses had them gathered at Israel. They just saw this awesome God lead them through the sea. That's pretty, that must have been awesome too. And now they come to the mountain and they're going to get a word from God uh, in the form of the law, which Moses begins to scribble out, both the Ten Commandments and all the rest of it. Uh, and this is where they're going to start learning that. But So they're corrected, number one, about creation. And then look on the next sentence. While Genesis 1 establishes Yahweh as the sovereign creator and enthroned king, Genesis 2 and 3, the next two chapters, lays the cornerstone of how Yahweh is the covenantal Lord of the Hebrews. These chapters, 2 and 3, connect the work of God done for Israel in the Exodus to God's work with Adam and Eve. In other words, they link Israel's story with that of the first humans. That's what we're going to begin seeing today, this covenantal foundation. Moses is using, he's really doing this. He's talking to Israel, but he's also telling the story of Adam and Eve and you're going to see that there's, there's a, a connection. Uh, they're related in very vital ways. Um, and that's really important. I, and I mentioned this before, to, you know, because when I was growing up and you, you start reading Genesis, you, you start thinking of science. You start thinking of the theories of evolution. You start thinking of uh, how long it was. Whatever, there's all those kinds of things. And of course they address that in, 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 in their own way, but, but that's not, you know, where Genesis wasn't written to a cosmology class. It was written to the <coughs> Israelites who had gathered at Sinai. And so they're the ones getting the lesson and it, it obviously addresses us. It, affects us, but they're the ones getting that lesson. And so again, as we've said, he's not only giving 
a, an account of creation here, but he was letting them know that God is in covenant with them. And he begins telling that by, by telling the story of Adam and Eve. So what then, this is one of your questions, I think, what then is a covenant? Which was a common way of doing business then. Yes, ma'am. It's also a promise which is never broken by God. Yes, that's so important. In fact, when you hear uh, the word in the, in our English version, steadfast love, you you hear that all through the the Old Testament and the Psalms. Most of the time, you could you could translate that covenant love. Because that's what he's talking, it's steadfast love. It's something that God, I mean, it's in blood, actually, as we'll see as we go through. Uh, and and it, it can't be broken. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what a covenant is. Any other comments on covenant? Well, the book gives us a definition. Uh... In the ancient Near East, a covenant at base was a promissory oath to do something sealed, that is, had a seal on it, sealed in the name of a God to ensure its fulfillment. You know, and that's, that's how the whole Eastern Mediterranean world did business. Uh, why does he use the word promissory note versus contract? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I would think that the covenant in the end, it, it's more than just an impersonal document, but it is based on a personal promise. I don't know if that's... Yeah. What what do you take away from that? A Did, a promissory oath is not as strong as a contract. Oh, okay. it's not as enforceable. Well, from God it could be. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I, I, understand, I understand. It just seems that he could have used that. Oh, yeah, is it, that's isn't it. Isn't a promissory note something like putting a down payment on a house? That's you that would something yeah. down because you haven't got to pay the house. You're, you're probably right. Oath. That's an oath. Yeah, it's a promissory oath. And and I think all of those things are involved because when you get to the New Testament, we still have that terminology of the Holy Spirit being a down payment now. For us, He's the seal. It's like a down payment. I mean, it's unbreakable. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Yeah. And it doesn't, and that's what faith is. I mean, it's all living by faith, living based on something that's written down. And and I didn't want to go into it now, but I will. In, in that, I think Brandon did. I've heard another sermon recently on this, so I can't remember who. But uh, you know, the way they did these contracts, you know, they would kill animals mm -hmm. and then spread them out, and then the big king would make the little king after they did all the, here's what's the deal. Here, here are the, uh, you know, we'll get to this in a minute, but here are the stipulations and sanctions of this contract or promissory oath, whatever term we might want to use. And then after they settled what, what, what was promised and so forth and what was expected, <clears throat> then they would have this ceremony where they would kill innocent animals, spread their carcasses out, and then the lesser king had to walk through the, the blood. And the image of that contract, that oath, that promise was, if you don't keep what I'm stipulating as part of this deal, then you're going to be like those animals. That's yes. the deal. 
Um, and that's why it's so fascinating when you get to Gen. We'll get there in a couple of weeks, maybe. And then this is what Brandon preached on. I think it was him. <laughs> uh, what is so fascinating about that story with Abraham is they laid the animals out when God made these promises to Abraham. And yet, who walked through the carcasses? God. Usually, it's the guy that's going to get canned. And that's what he was saying. May these curses be on me if I don't keep my word. Meaning, I'm going to keep my word. And, and that's what's so fascinating about the Lord. is, uh, and, and for us, the promises are a promissory oath or a contract. I, I don't know the answer. That would be good to ask the guy. You know, he promised. Huh? He promised. Yeah, but, but why he chose that word so, over what I mean there, I don't know. But uh, 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 hmm. you're a lawyer, right? You're a lawyer? Yeah. That's uh -oh. probably why you're asking that question. <laughs> You think like a lawyer, right? Rebuke <laughs> me. <laughs> That's a good thing in the end. Because it's interesting when you get to the Paul, to the Paul, to Paul, so much of his language is courtroom and, and legal. Uh, and uh, we'll get there eventually. But. Cannot a covenant be uh, a promise that you have made with the Lord about something that you would cherish and, and do? Yeah, there could be the covenant on our side too. I mean, we we, side, yeah. we we use the word sanctification to describe that process that having been set right with God by his covenant, we are by the work of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> promising also to be faithful. But it's not the same because it's familial at that point. I mean, if if my children are not faithful, I'm not going to kick them out of the family. You know, yes, ma'am. Could I make Because when you said um, it was usually the vessel who walked through the pieces, mm -hmm. in, in the historic covenant, it was both. Mm -hmm. They both walked through. The that, vessel wasn't the one who walked through. Both walked through. They may have, yeah. Okay. I've heard it both ways, so okay. I, I don't know. Heard, yeah. But, okay. but, uh, but it would make sense if they both had, because if the king didn't keep his end, the chances are the king wouldn't have put himself in that position. But anyway, well, it's kind of yeah, the yeah, that's the that's the that's the point. Is the blood? It takes blood to cut to cut a covenant, and when you get to Hebrews, you see that in the person of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So. Uh, so the, Israel then was in this, a, what we're going to find out is that Israel uh, is in this covenant. And, uh, and in every covenant, there are stipulations and sanctions. Um, let, look, let us read them, you know, Deuteronomy, just to give an example, Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 3. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy 28. These are blessings for Israel's obedience to the covenant, which is the whole law of God. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. That is, your whole lives will be blessed. And then chapter, the same chapter, 15 and 16, you read about curses. Uh, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, verse 15, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you, and overtake you. Cursed, 
shall you be in the city, <clears throat> excuse me, and cursed shall you be in the field. The same language of everything about your life. So, so then this is what Moses is saying to the people when they gather at the Mount Sinai to receive word from God for the first time uh, that they are entering into covenant with him. And then what he does is he, in Genesis, after talking about creation, uh, goes into this narrative uh, about Adam and Eve. And he's showing how in the very beginning, God began a covenant relationship with Adam and Eve and how that will eventually compare to the kind of covenant he's entering into with Israel. So how do we know that, because you know the author points out that the word covenant is not used in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And so people have questioned, well, how do we know then that that's how God is, how Moses was using Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to show this covenant relationship? But, and he points out that the word sin also is not used in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, but it would be very irresponsible to say that sin is not, now that you know the rest of the Bible, that sin is not a subject of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. So you can use images and words and concepts without using a particular word in order to, to communicate. So one reason we know is because there is this, there are the formal features of the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve. And let's read that, Genesis 2. And you'll see this, this rhythm of the covenant, this rhythm of the contract, this rhythm of this ancient uh, practice here in Genesis 2, 15, 16, and 17. <clears throat> the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, Stipulations. You may surely eat of every... Well, actually, the stipulation started back up where he says, in the garden to work it and to keep it. That's part of the stipulation that God enters into with Adam. And then he goes on, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So the stipulations are work it, keep it, this garden, and you may eat, you may not eat. And then the sanctions you find in the same passage. If you obey as we hear in the rest of the story, uh, they would have inherited, actually, the tree of life, which would, is a blessing for obedience. Uh, but the curse is that if you fail to keep the garden, to guard the garden, to, to work the garden, or if you <laughs> sin by deliberately going to that tree and taking of it when I said not to, then you will die. That's the stipulations uh, of this covenant. Um, and we know the rest of the story that they didn't keep the covenant in any way, they didn't keep it. They didn't. Uh, they didn't work it, and they disobeyed with what they were supposed to eat or not eat. And so, 
for their curse, they were barred from the tree of life. And, and, the, and then exiled. They were sent out of the garden, <coughs> supposedly, so they couldn't get to the tree. Because they could have then, if they had eaten it then, they would have perhaps been in a perpetual state of damnation, curse. Uh, that, well, you can do a little play on words because when Satan said, you surely you're not going to die, mm -hmm. they did die. Mm -hmm. In a sense. Yeah. yeah. Because then they knew evil. Yep. And, and they didn't have that closeness with God. Exactly. Right. And the Hebrew, it's interesting, is dying you shall die. Uh, so, obviously, we know that at that moment they weren't annihilated. Right. He could have, but he, they weren't. But they did die, so it was this decaying process that began, not just in their bodies, but in their souls, which is, in, which is exemplified in the fact that they were barred from his presence. Right. Only mm -hmm. holy things can be in God's presence. None of none of us. No, what's that passage in Hebrews? Uh, ex, uh, doggone it! Never mind. <laughs> but it's something to the effect that you know, without without holy. Oh, that is that's it. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Again, indicative of the fact that God is holy. Only holy things are in His presence. So that's a dilemma. Obviously, we'll, hopefully, we'll, as the scriptures unfold, we'll answer that. Because if you're honest with yourself, are you holy? No. no. Okay, that's a problem. That's a real problem. But we're not going to answer that right now. But that is a problem. Uh, so what are, uh, very, very quickly then, uh, the author gives us two or three pages of you know, we have this formal contract that seems to be pretty clear. Adam, you're here. This is what I want you to do. Do this, don't do that, and so forth. That's covenantal. But what are some other indications that the author gives of the fact that this was a covenant relationship between God, uh, between Adam and Eve and God? Well, didn't he say someplace in there, I will be your God? He said that to Abraham. Yeah. I, I don't know if he there said was, that to... There was something in there to indicate that it's the establishment of God. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what... The first one he wrote was, holiness is not inherent in creation, but comes by God's dictate. That's what he says. Creation is not yeah. holy in and of itself. Places and objects become holy only by God's declaration or action. Yahweh must declare a place holy. He must live right for it to be. Yeah. He puts that in first. Yeah. In that, oops. That's, I'm not there. You skipped the page. Uh, you went right to there you Okay. Yeah, so that's what Linda was just talking about. He, he begins to establish this, the other, other identifiers of covenantal, this covenantal nature, by, by pointing out that uh, God, there, no place is holy except what God says is holy. Uh, and, and, and also he makes it holy by being there and he will only be in places that are holy look at, look at Deuteronomy this is just an example mentioned, that mentions this Deuteronomy 12 Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers Deuteronomy <clears throat> 12 these verse 1 these are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord the God of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their God on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. 
You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. What commandment does that remind you of? The Ten Commandments. Yeah, that one and the second one. And probably the third one. What are they? You shall have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, and thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God. So how we worship God is important that as important that we worship God. Uh, so where did I finish? Verse four. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Five. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go. It's holy because God says it is. And so he eventually made the tabernacle, told them how to do that, and that's the place that God says that's holy. Because I said it is and because that's where I'm going to be. And you see examples of that in like the burning bush. I mean, it's a bush. No one goes out and hugs a bush. They're tree huggers, I guess. But you don't normally go out and bow down and do obeisance to a bush. Uh, and don't, you don't normally talk to bushes. Some people do, I think. You're supposed to be the part of a green thumb, right? But, uh, and the three amigos, they had a, a singing bush. Remember? Yeah. That was funny. But... Uh, but this bush talked, it burned, but not up. It didn't burn up, but it was on fire. That's pretty odd. But anyway, when Moses walked up to it, what did God say? Take your shoes off, because this place is holy. Moses might have thought it's a bush. But he knew that God was there, because God spoke to him. God made himself clear to him, and so... When you're in the presence of God, it's a holy place. And if God says that's holy because I'm going to be there, then that's, that's what it is. And so you get this sense from Moses about the garden. Moses, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And he was there in the presence, in their presence, uh, in the garden. And then I, this is interesting, that third bullet up there, the significance of gardens in the ancient world. I love what he said about this, page 19. Page 19. Oh, yeah, where it says in the middle of the page, third, he's giving different characteristics, one, two, three, and four. The third one in the middle of the 19. The combination of wonderful gardens and gods invoked both the ideas of temple and the duty to maintain, which fell on the king and or priest. Kings often planted verdant gardens next to the deity's shrine, and it was their task to maintain the fruitfulness of and purity of the temple garden. That's awesome. So that was a practice, and this is how God said, I'm going to start it all in a garden, because people all around know the significance of a garden. And he started it in a garden. Um, and it, we're not going to look at it uh, unless you did your own studies and really want to talk about it. Exodus, Exodus, Ezekiel 28, which is a, a passage, it, 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 it's a passage of, you know, the, the prophecy, because the, the Ezekiel was a prophet, and he's prophesying about the king of Tyre, which is a real place over there, you know, Tyre and Sidon and all these countries, uh, and he was, uh, uh, you know, a, a vicious ruler, but yet at the same time, he was had some admirable qualities, but anyway, throughout the uh, the prophecy Ezekiel just mentions and makes comparisons between Tyre of uh, not Tyre, the king of Tyre, uh, and and Eden and Adam. 
So if you have time later, read that. And it's pretty interesting. You'll get just a better insight of how the scriptures looked at Eden. And it was thought of as this place of God. The dwelling place of God. Uh, and so... Um, <clears throat> so you, you, these are some indicators of this uh, covenantal relationship uh, let's look too at the bottom of page 19 yeah I'll read I'll read from the bottom up to up to the top of 20 finally you see that? These temple gardens had to be cared for and protected. Impurities and detestable things were walled out because they were all supposed to symbolize God or the king or that whole magnificent setting. Uh, the garden had to be tended to shield it from chaos, decay, and death of the outside world. Caring for such sacred space excuse me, was a priestly duty, but this responsibility was often taken up by the kings. As such then, Eden was a type of sacred place and Adam was put in it as a priest king to work it and guard it. Isn't that what Genesis 2.15 said? Yeah. The word here for work, that is work of the garden, is often used of the priestly service in worship. You can see a reference to that in Numbers. And guarding, quote, was performed by both the priests and Levites to protect the temple from defilement. You see these same practices when the temple was eventually built. These parallels between Adam and the sanctuary temple further reveal the covenantal background of the Garden of Eden. Just as Israel's priesthood was in covenant with Yahweh, so was Adam's in the beginning. Okay, so again, we're, we're establishing early on when you start the Bible and its unfolding message to see this covenantal nature of God with his creation and his people. And that will be very clear. Uh, man, I more than want to finish this. <laughs> we'll see. So, um, so, wh so what's the nature then of the covenant that God established with Adam? Well, we did this a few weeks ago, actually, many, before we even started this book. Uh, in, 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 in realized that Adam, when he was created, he was formed from the dust, he was brought into a covenant of, as this author puts it, obedience. Other theologians use the word works, a covenant of works. If anybody could have done it as a human, it was Adam before he fell. Um, and that's... Um, and in fact, he, it was works, salvation by works with Adam. If he wanted to live forever, he had to obey. Uh, it, that's how he got the tree of life. And he didn't, so God ran him out. Now, Adam is a unique person as a human because he was able to obey. The image of God in him was untainted. He was made by God and said, very good, at the end of his creation week. Uh, but he was able to disobey too. If, 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 if you want to talk about free will, that's the only place it was really and truly free. Now we can do what we want, for sure. And that's since we're free. But we're not, 
our nature is not free. We're bound to our fallen nature now. At, not as Christians, I'm talking about humanity as fallen. Uh, a person can't just believe now. A, a person outside of Christ cannot obey sufficient to get the tree of life. Adam could. Nobody else can because sin has done such a number on us that we're, we're dead. You know, Jesus used that term. Paul uses that term in the New Testament. We're spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. And so we're, you know, we can't, a dead person can't make a choice. Uh, and so that's what the fall did to us. We're unable to obey. We're only able to disobey. We don't have time, but, you know, Romans 3 is that passage that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. They're all out there. <laughs> There's no fear of God before them. That's Paul's description of the fallen nature. And then here's, here's what our article says, nine. I think I put it on here. I don't know if you can read it. It's pretty, and it's the older English. It's, it's not as, you know, we don't talk like this. But let me read it. Just to let you know that this is Anglican. You know, we're not saying this outside the Anglican way of thinking. Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam. In other words, we're not sinners because we sin. The Pelagians, the people that Augustine fought, which still infects the church to this day, always has, always will. Now it's more semi-Pelagian, but it's the same problem, saying that man can do it if he really wants to. Do your best. You know, that whole 1950s, uh, <coughs> who are some of those speakers? You can't think of the positive speakers. Uh, huh? Yeah, today. But it, in the 50s, it started with guys and I. It's, not interesting. it's gone. But anyway, they all taught like semi pelagians Like, we're not really fallen. We're just kind of off track. The liberals, any liberal denomination thinks that way. You know, that humans are basically good people. And we are on levels of one to 10, humanly speaking, but we can't obey as God commanded Adam because of sin. And so we're falling short of that glory of God, as Paul puts it. Uh, so semi-Pelagianism says, nah, you're okay. You just need help getting back on the right path. We need a coach. You know, let Jesus be your coach. I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah, that's it. And, and we don't teach that. We're saying, no, we don't need a coach. We need a savior. We're dead in a deep hole. So, not. I mean, if we were, yeah. So, so it's not following Adam, but it is the fault and corruption of the nature of every man that naturally engendered of the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone. <laughs> from original righteousness and is of his own nature inclined to evil so that the flesh lusteth always contrary to the spirit. We can't obey the way we can't perform the righteousness of God. And therefore, in every person born into this world, it deserves God's wrath and damnation. That's heavy, you know, but it's true. And this infection of nature doth remain, yea, in them that are regenerated. I mean, don't you find that you still wrestle with sin? This lust, this, in, this tendency to sin, it's, it's there. Whereby the lust of the flesh, called in the Greek, <coughs> pronema sarkos. Yeah, I remembered that. See? <laughs> pronema sarkos. That means flesh. Which some do expound the wisdom, some sensuality, some the effects, some the desire of the flesh, is not subject to the law of God. Okay. And although there is no condemnation for them that believe, I say that every time we do absolution mm -hmm. and are baptized, yet the apostles do confess that concupiscence, the tendency, the, the orientation towards sin and lust, has of itself the nature of sin. In other words, it's not just doing the act, but we're sinful by nature and it's deep. It's all the way. Uh, so, uh, so this is the kind of thing. Adam was able, but he couldn't, and, but he didn't. Uh, but here's, whoops. And, but here's the interesting thing. Adam could, he didn't, we can't. 
But those who believe in Jesus are accepted as having obeyed. See, that's what we need for our assurance. God looks at you and says, in Jesus, I understand and, and declare you to be such as one who obeyed fully. That's who you are in God's sight. That's what justification is all about. You have been declared righteous. It's true. Why? Because the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed to you. It has been put into your bank accounts. Not yours by your own hard work. Jesus did all the work, but you have his righteousness. And you are right now, that's what the whole doctrine of justification is about. You're declared righteous in Jesus. And the doctrine of sanctification says it's going to become a reality in your life. Progressively now, you may or may not be aware of it fully, but God is working in you to change you to the image of Christ. And one day you will see him as he is and you will be fully formed into him. Uh, read the, what does that say? Paragraph number one, page 20. Um, is my paragraph number one. I don't know if it's yours. Very quickly here. All right. A covenant of obedience. Yahweh's covenant with, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yahweh's covenant with Adam was a covenant of obedience in which Adam and Eve had to obey for life everlasting. Being fashioned after God's image, Adam and Eve were fully capable of doing so, but it is precisely within these priestly duties where the couple failed. First, instead of being guardians, they allowed the crafty serpent in the holy garden where he did not belong. Then he planted a profane desire within them which sprouted into coveting and blossomed into sin, and they took and they eat, ate. So, um, so Adam was in this covenant and he failed. And then the question is, what about Israel? And, and as, as the author says, um, Exodus, where they were at Mount Sinai after having gone through and so forth, echoes Eden. But it's an ominous echo. Uh, and the question that is being raised by Moses going over Genesis 1, 2, and 3 with them is, how are we going to do? Because here, when they confirm the covenant, we've got time to read these, Moses confirmed the covenant and he brought it down and he, he kind of introduced it to the people. And what did they say? Yeah. We'll do it all. These words we will do. Bring it on. And Moses sprinkled the blood on them and said, okay, the blood's on you. You know, even though we didn't walk through the animals, the blood's on you. If you don't keep it, you see what happened to Adam and Eve? What happened? They got exiled. You know what's going to happen to you? You're going to get into your land. It's going to be glorious, land of milk and honey flowing with, you know. And then what's going to happen if you don't obey? You're going to get exiled. What happened? They got exiled. They didn't do too well. In fact, right after God, Moses was on the mountaintop. This is the biggest event in human history. He's getting word from God literally. God literally put it on a rock for him. And he brought it down after having confirmed the covenant already. He brought it down. And what were they doing? They were committing adultery on the day of the honeymoon. I mean, what kind of relationship is that going to be? It's not going to be a good one. And that's what was happening with Israel. They were already fawning over this God they had formed. And they were actually, Aaron got moved, got sucked into it. And he actually told, told the people, these are, these are the gods that brought you. I mean, they didn't, I mean, they were trying to do it in, in, in conjunction with worship of Yahweh, I'm sure. But it was messed up. And, and Moses, God was really ticked. Uh, let's look at that real fast. Uh, 
Exodus 32, 7 to 10. Exodus 32. This is, and the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people, and when you brought, whom you brought up out of the land, having corrupted themselves, they have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They've made for themselves a golden calf and worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff neck people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. In other words, I'll just start over. And Moses intercedes for them and God relents. But then Moses comes down and he's, he's when he finally gets there and sees it, he can't control himself. And he throws the tablets down, smashes it, grinds it, mixes it with water, and made them drink it. Now, he was ticked. And, uh, and they, they were like... Uh, so, you know, that was God's holy place, Mount Sinai. That's why they couldn't go up to the top. Only Moses, the, who was then the advocate, the mediator for the people. In our liturgy, what do we say? At, when I say the prayer after Sammy Joe leads in the people of the prayer, the prayers of the people, uh, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Moses was then because it was a holy place of God. Jesus is that for all believers uh, in the holy place, which is at the right hand of God, or now the church and us individually, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to, uh, we're almost done. Um, just look at page, I was going to finish up by asking you questions. Maybe we can do that next week as we start a new lesson. Um, look at the look at page twenty three. Well, let me let me just summarize. Okay, we got thirty seconds. <laughs> page page twenty two. Okay, in your book, <clears throat> this is probably a good summary of, of what we've just done. Adam failed, Israel flunked, but by His grace, God preserved them until that son of Eve crushed the serpent to free them from sin and death. Christ prevailed and rose victorious as the righteous one. We have eternal life and justification, not because we've kept the covenant of works, but through the works of another, freely given to us by faith. The opening chapters of Genesis then show both us and Israel who Yahweh is. Yahweh is the one God, the almighty creator, who alone is from eternity. Yahweh is our covenantal redeemer who is merciful and gracious. And Yahweh is the God who became man, Jesus Christ, to bring us to that new and greater Eden, the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. That's a beautiful picture. And that's, that's how the Bible begins this beautiful unfolding drama uh, in the book of Genesis. So next time we'll meet with, in start chapter 